So once, so Ray, once you've been exposed to these chemicals um, through air pollution, it, um, is it, is your destiny, you know, baked in or, you know, does diet play a role in whether or not, you know, you'll be the lucky one who doesn't get it and somebody else who has a terrible diet does get it? H how does that work? We really just don't have great evidence on this. Uh, Evan saying, you know, we're all consumed with doing a randomized control trial and it's really hard to randomize people to breathe bad air or breathe good air. Um, so we don't have a uh, great uh, evidence. Um, I, 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 we just want great evidence. So, so what do you do is you, you make best guesses and best judgments. And so um, I think if I were at risk for these things, I would stop my exposure to stop uh, my exposure to them. Um, I would stop my exposure to that. And would you also suggest eating the healthiest diet you can? Yeah, yeah. So the best, you know, the the best studied diet, uh, as as Dr. Blake was alluding to, is the Mediterranean diet. So we know that people who eat a Mediterranean diet are have a twenty percent associated with a twenty percent decreased risk of developing Parkinson's, and it appears that the Mediterranean diet uh, may slow the rate of progression of Parkinson's. Again, lots of maize. And there, because it's just really hard to randomize people to diet A versus diet B and follow them for long periods of time. But, you know, I, I certainly will. I have tell all my patients to avoid pesticides like the plague, especially if you've lost, you know, 60 percent of your nerve cells uh, for Parkinson's disease. And that doesn't just mean diet. That also means like, what are you putting on your yard? What are your neighbors putting on the yard? What are your what's the golf course putting on their uh, greens? Um, you know, what's in the, your well water? Uh, where you live, what's being sprayed in your area. I mean, there are lots and lots of ways that we're getting exposed to these toxic chemicals that people have no idea. People live near dry cleaning sites and don't know it. The, this, these chemicals can evaporate and be in your indoor air, can be in the air of your kids. I went to high school in Newport Beach, California, not too far from where Evan is. And there is a aerospace facility that has these chemicals in the underground water and people are breathing in these chemicals Kids in Newport Beach, California, in multi-million dollar homes are breathing in these chemicals right now as we speak because they sit on top of an aerospace facility that was contaminated with these chemicals. And these chemicals also cause cancer and are strongly linked to leukemia in kids. Um, we're just really not aware of what's going on in our, our environment and how much our environment is influencing who's getting Parkinson's, who's getting Alzheimer's, who's getting leukemia, who's getting liver cancer, kidney cancer, breast cancer, and the list goes on and on. I'd like to ask Ray something as well, if I could. Sure. What is your understanding, Ray, of the role of BMAA in Parkinson's disease? Oh, good luck. <laughs> right, I'm here taking notes when you guys go into nutrition. So you got to help me out on BMAA because <laughs> you guys know BMAA more. BMAA is, is beta an methyl amino L alanine, yeah. and it is a uh, cyanobacteria found in certain areas of the ocean. It's bioaccumulated in especially bottom feeders like shrimp and crabs, but also found in many fish in certain areas at certain times. When they do analyses of who has the most BMAA, Parkinson's comes up the highest. And ALS, amyotropic lateral sclerosis, is very tightly linked to BMAA in Guam, where they ate a lot of BMAA. ALS was just an epidemic. Also for Alzheimer's disease, BMAA was higher compared to controls where it's lower. So it's a good reason to avoid shrimp and crabs and other fish because the BMAA is a deadly toxin. Its structure is similar to glutamate. So it can create excitotoxicity and damage brain cells. It interferes with the and kills the dopamine producing cells. Very dangerous. I, I did want to also respond to one reason the Mediterranean diet is easier for people with Parkinson's is because it doesn't have the great excesses of protein as most American diets are between one and 200 grams per day, whereas we need about 50. And the Mediterranean diet's only 100 grams per day, so only 50 excess grams of protein a day. The excess protein limits our ability to get tyrosine uh, an essential amino acid and a precursor to lipidopa into the brain. When we don't have excessive protein, we're more able through the large neutral amino acid transporter, get this tyr tyrosine into the bloodstream and into the brain. When it gets into the brain, then through tyrosine hydroxylase, it becomes levodopa and can supplement the drug levodopa. And then of course, we know that that can be made into dopamine. So reducing 
dietary protein is a tremendous asset for people with Parkinson's disease to reduce symptoms. Many of the studies are showing symptoms cut by more than half. So just a, so I did a quick research. Thank you, uh, Evan and uh, Steve for uh, helping with my, my ignorance. So BMAA and air pollution and these pesticides and this dry cleaning chemical all damage the energy producing parts of cells called the mitochondria. So your brain is like a gas guzzling machine. So it only accounts for 33% of your body weight, but 20% of your energy demands are from your brain, three quarters of it from the nerve cells, neurons. And it turns out that these dopamine producing nerve cells that are damaged in Parkinson's disease are chock full of mitochondria. They have a million different connections to other nerve cells. If you stretched out one of these nerve cells, it would be four meters in length, you know, twice the height of like, you know, LeBron James. Um, and so they have huge energy requirements, which might explain why these dopaminergic nerve cells that are damaged in Parkinson's disease uh, are selectively vulnerable to mitochondrial toxicants, of which BMAA is one, air pollution can act as one, uh, certain pesticides target the mitochondria, and these dry cleaning chemicals are all known to be uh, toxicants. And polychlorinated biphenols are also one of the worst for Parkinson's disease because of the disruption to tyrosine hydroxylase so that we can't make our own levodopa and dopamine. The polychlorinated biphenols, the PCBs, are another persistent organic pollutant that are epidemic. They stopped using them in 1977 and switched to polychlorinated biphenyl ethers, which are every bit as bad and just as deadly to our ability to make dopamine. They're definitely killing off dopamine producing cells. And I like your description, the, the axons of the cells in the dopamine producing areas go down to the stratum. They're very long and they take a lot of support and are very vulnerable. They're also very vulnerable to oxidation, which is what kills a lot of them too. Okay, well, speaking about athletes, um, and not as a unit of measure, but um, uh, going to sports, what is the the role of head trauma uh, um, and its effect of, on, on Parkinson's and Alzheimer's? And should is it so dangerous and such a high risk that people should avoid playing football? Yes. <laughs> yes. I think he, I think you're, I think you're right. Um, so there was a study done and uh, published in JAMA. They looked at uh, 200, the brains of 203 NFL players, and they found evidence of chronic traumatic encephalopathy in 202 of the 203 brains. <laughs> they looked I, I at the brains of that. like, um, they looked at the brains of semi-professional athletes, uh, semi-professional football players, and there was lower. Uh, but even high schools, like three of 18, I think, of the high school players had evidence of chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Head trauma is just not good uh, for your brain. It's linked to, obviously, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. It's uh, This is like what all the NFL football players, Mike Webster Jr., Seau, and others uh, have. Uh, it's linked to Alzheimer's disease. It's linked to ALS. Uh, it's linked to Parkinson's uh, disease. Um, uh, there's a football player, Chris Ballard, I think, Chris Ballard, I can't remember his name. Uh, he was a rookie for the San Francisco 49ers, led the team in tackles, and he just gave up after a year, not because he wasn't good enough, because he was good enough, but he was just really concerned about it. Um, I, I think we should be really thinking about it. You know, I feel guilty when I watch a football, you know, because it's a neurologist. Uh, I think we can make modifications, I think, especially for kids. And I think, you know, even thinking about soccer and you know, getting rid of uh, headers, for example. Uh, there are a couple of women soccer players who say, you know, the idea that we're heading a ball that's been kicked 40 feet in the air, maybe that's not the best idea in the world. Um, I think there are lots of things that we can do to protect our brains and so that we can live uh, healthier lives for longer periods of time. All right, so boxing out, brain may injury, out. Traumatic yeah. brain injury resultant from these types of injuries as well as car wrecks, military actions, and head butting in football. We see in people in the Maui Memory Clinic who are coming in years later as older folks, those with traumatic brain injury are more prone to get dementia. And Parkinson's disease definitely is related to traumatic brain injury. But when you look at what happens after this type of injury, it's, it's possible to treat it soon afterwards, but the window of opportunity closes after about six months and the damage is usually remaining with the person. 
And just one little caveat here. I, I think people like say, you know, they get pissed off. No, none, no, none of this, all this stuff. Listen, we should have more sports and more p- physical education and more athletics. And, you know, team sports have enormous benefits uh, for individuals and societies. These are things we should be encouraging. We should just make those sports as safe as possible for people. I mean, the NFL, and the, their all pro game, you know, they had flag football. I mean, who knows? Flag football could be even more popular than the NFL um, or, you know, than tackle football. There, we should be encouraging sports. We should be encouraging uh, physical exercise and athletics and team sports and camaraderie and the culture and, and uh, many of the great things that surround uh, sports. We should just be doing so in a way that um, minimize the risk for uh, long lasting uh, complications. Uh, and I think especially we should be doing that for kids. Mm-hmm.